Yeah, he gave, gave up this uh, water for you because it's very <laughs> Last one, just better fix my voice. What's that? It's my last thing to uh, keep speaking. Paul Walters will present you. I will present you about uh, IPsec and SLVPNs, how to set up, set them up in Fedora and uh, uh, CentOS or Red. It's pretty much similar. And uh, yeah, it, it's a workshop, so it's pretty much not. At least the first part will not be much of a presentation. You you have to follow the instructions and try the stuff in your laptop. Uh, the second part. We'll have uh, some presentation as well. And uh, so, in the first part, 45 minutes, we'll present the uh, uh, Open Connect SSL VPN. And the second part, it will be the IPsec, uh, uh, Libris One, with the IPsec VPN. So, before we start, a few points. Uh, there are two types of VPN uh, side to side. Uh, when you connect a LAN to another LAN, a, side, a remote side to another remote side, and re remote access. Uh, Remote access is when you go outside your work and you want to connect to your LAN and uh, use the resources from your work. Uh, when do we need uh, which? When, when should you choose IPsec or an SSL VPN? SSL VPN is very restricted. It can only be used, pretty, it's only used for remote access mainly. Unless you are a very small site, uh, you want to use IPsec for site to site uh, communication. And, and why is that? First, a VPN is very easy to set up for remote access for a user. Uh, many the, many VPNs will just work. The user goes to the browser, connects to a site, and he's logged in the VPN using a browser plugin. So as uh, uh, user-friendly, it can be made uh, a lot. And it has uh, an advantage that it can tolerate, it can operate under very broken firewall. So if the firewall blocks everything and except HTTPS, you can still connect with an SSL VPN. Uh, Which means you can also use it to circumvent network restrictions of being allowed to use a VPN. Yes, in, in fact, uh, a lot of Chinese uh, use as, uh, Open Connect just because they want to get out of the firewall of China. Uh, it's a bit more flexible in, app in applying various restrictions to different users. Uh, for example, you want to put them in a particular C group or put a particular bandwidth limits. I, I don't know whether this granularity you can do with IPsec. You can do the same. Yeah. Okay. You can, usually, it's done with uh, X five nine certificate. So you put like sales in one group and programs in another. Okay. And so this is not entirely accurate. Uh, IPsec has the advantage because everything is done in the kernel. You can have the kernel. Uh, uh, you can do everything in the kernel. You reduce context switches, and it's a bit faster. It's, uh, it's more efficient uh, when you use it uh, for handling a big load. Uh, it has some better privacy than TLS. It's a protocol issue. SSL uh, sends a certificate in the clear, while IPsec encrypts the certificate. Uh, before the connection. So a passive attacker will not see who is connected if you use certificate authentication. Okay, uh, that's pretty much a, a, the introduction. I don't know if you have any questions. If not... Sir, talk a little uh, bit louder. Yeah, uh, there's no microphone. Uh, if you can come uh, <laughs> closer. So, uh, I will start with setting up uh, the client uh, as an uh, introduction. It's the easy part in Open Connect. So, I don't know how many of you have the door uh, to, to use uh, to start installing the client. And uh, we'll 
you will set up a simple like line uh, with the username and password authentication. So you'll connect to a site which uh, accept the username and password. Uh, we have created users with that, that name on this server. Uh, so there are eight users you can use. You can select which one uh, to, to use when you connect. And now we go to the command line client. You need to install it first in your Fedora. The command is yum install uh, open connect. You can actually watch it from here, or you can, if you can see the small letters there, you can connect to Deathrapper directly. It's ethopat.wikimedia.org slash p slash open connect dash vpn dash workshop. So if you raise your hands when you, for a moment, when you do that installation, I will have an idea how we are progressing because there are many. <coughs> so have people here set up VPNs before or is this all new for them? Yes, no. <laughs> if you have set up a VPN before, any kind of VPN, just raise your hand. Okay. okay. Anyone so, used OpenConnect? No, anyone used IPsec? So most people used OpenVPN. Hmm. <coughs> and after you install uh, the client, you connect to the server using this uh, command line. So is this the, what, what is that, Ser server cert? The, the server cert is to, you can skip it, but you will avoid uh, a warning, but it doesn't know the server, and then server certificate. So Do this is public it? key, effectively, in cash uh, box. Has, has of the public key, yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, you can skip it, and you can type yes. So you have a smaller thing to type. If I skip it, I ask for no password. Uh, if it, it will ask for a password because it's username, password authentication. The the users are. What's it? Yeah, uh, the user is this. If you use user one, yeah. mm -hmm. and the password is exactly the same as the user. Yeah, it's etherpad.wikimedia.org. Maybe you can paste it to the fan. Ah, yes, yes, that will be smart. After you connect, how do you know it works? You should be able to access the internal network. And that will be by pinging. You can test it by pinging uh, this IP address. And if DNS works, you should be able to ping. Sorry, one more zero. There. It's 100. 100. The 10? The 10 should be a 100. 100? Yes.
The, uh, the address range 100.64 is a special range used for carrier grade NAT. Uh, so it's a reversed uh, range and it's never meant to leak on the internet. So it's sort of like RFC 1918 space, except most people don't use it. So using that address range on your VPN avoids conflicts like when if you're behind NAT and the Wi-Fi range. So of course I shouldn't have told you this range, but now everybody will start using it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you want me to change the server configuration? Or you have no, I, 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 I put one huh? in it in Okay. And I am getting system D journal D at defconf no x.ca spam auth authentication failure from OC sir. Someone's using wrong password. Or wrong username. <coughs> yeah, I typed the VPN test one as a password. I'm not able to connect it. There's two users online. <coughs> uh, try different users, maybe. Oh no, there's four and others. Okay. I see another authentication failure on the server. some protection in the server if it is being flooded by the same IP address. So I don't know if you all share an external IP address. Actually, yes. Okay. I'll have to change the server configuration uh, so it accepts. Connect everyone already connected. Does it work now? Yeah. Mm, this was passport. The same as the username. VPN test one, two, three, four.
Nichols, the server is still giving authentication errors? Maybe there are some typos and because I was able to get one. I think maybe if yeah, one person is already online, maybe yeah. the second one gives a failure. There is a maximum 16 users uh, per, 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 per user username. Mm -hmm. So you just select randomly from zero, from one to eight. Did anyone get to the Firefox page? Uh, yeah. Doesn't work? Or? It yes. works? Not, work for me. Not for me. What is the display? Yeah. And did, did the ping work? I can't even connect. Can ah. connect. Uh, try six. You can test six. Test. So there are people who got the ping working? Yeah. Okay. But not the web page. Yeah, it, 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 it works. So this DNS name doesn't exist in the public, it only exists on your own VPN. So it's a confirmation that you're actually using the VPN. Has someone a problem connecting? Yeah. Who? Oh. I am. Oh. <laughs> so I get this. Yeah. So the server, uh, because basically, uh, which is disabled by default. Un unauthorized. Uh, which username? You use? Seven. Seven. Try three. Oh, I'm I'm in with four. Okay. At least it gave a different output. Okay, I'm increasing the number of views to. You should be disconnected now. I started the server, <laughs> and uh, but you should be able to connect with any username now. It wouldn't matter. So okay, uh, is anyone having still problems to connect? Except the disconnection that was intentional. Okay, the the second part is uh, you you can do the same thing with network manager. Uh, if you have Fedora, uh, you need to install uh, the Network Manager Open Connect plugin. This is uh, this part. Network Manager does Open Connect. And I've made uh, some screenshots uh, which can guide you to how to set, a, set up the network manager. You go to VPN settings. Uh, ignore me, it's a bit peculiar how you find this. Uh, I, I just go to the over, overview screen and type VPN, and it will, should pop up. The advantage of network manager is that it doesn't run as root, uh, so the connection is done uh, not as root, and only the parts that need to be executed as root are 
are executed as So it's a bit uh, safer and more, more well designed on the command line uh, client. And if you don't have a PC, you can actually uh, do it from your Android. If you have iPhone, uh, you can still do it, but uh, it's not an open source plan. Yeah, the yeah. timeouts. It's, but it's it's connected. Oh. You uh, uh, so it's supposed to be like that. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. But so checking ping from other. Mm -hmm. yes. Server overview. Uh, this is what the administrator sees. Let's say who, who is connected. Uh, you can see the user from which IP. Actually, everyone here has the same IP, but why this uh, issue was. <coughs> and how long he's connected. We'll see that uh, in, a, in a moment when we go to server setup. Problem with the network manager step? Yeah. yeah. I, I can connect. It's just it's connected, but I cannot access uh, the website. Okay. Yeah. The, the DNS is not uh, yeah. updated for some reason. I think you, because the ping works, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to write the other way. Did you ping the, the, the DNS address? What did you say? Uh, okay. Uh, one modified uh, 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 So there is no network manager open connecting route. Hi, ah, it's red. Yes, there is no. Uh, it is in a pedal. Uh, okay. I'm uh, you, you can do a simulation of that, uh, yes, uh, it's called uh, proxy ARP. Uh, there are some instructions in the Open Connect side how to set up proxy ARP. And uh, you, you get an IP that it's within the land that you are connected. I have to manually specify the, the resolver. There. On network manager. Network manager, I don't know what. Yeah, I, I don't know. It should have, have been there. I, I mean, it was working two days ago. <laughs> so I, I don't know what's there. <coughs> well, maybe it... Um, because I have the... Do you have the other one open? 
I have this setting in uh, I have this uh, DNS mask uh, that I use uh, caching the DNS server. Do you want that? Uh, you, you have modified it. Yeah, I have modified the default uh, configuration, so it uses the DNS mask for... Okay, I'm taking, uh, I'm taking a note of that. I, I don't know whether it's, it affects it or not, but... Uh, it work, for example, it, it for, works however on uh, Red Hat VPN. Normal, it should have worked, but it was just a casting thing. I think so. <coughs> it works for the Red Hat Open VPN. I don't have any the manual setting. So I don't know why. Okay. Um, I'm going to the next uh, step. Uh, you, you can do that uh, the same from uh, Android if you don't have uh, a laptop or if you have Windows, probably not here. Uh, you, you, there is also a, a client you can use. The same for Mac OS X. Uh, another another thing you, you may want to try is uh, certificate authentication. Uh, there are some test certificates you can use to connect to this server, and the command line is uh, this one. Uh, but I'm going to skip this test for now. I'll go to the server setup uh, directly. You can try this uh, uh, now or later, but I'll go to the server setup to make sure we have time. Yeah, the test server will be up during the entire conference, so feel free to use it and play with it. So, to, to make a server like the one you you, you connect, you need to install uh, Open Connect first, uh, the Open Connect server. So, in Fedora, that will be with this command. I will type it now. <laughs> it works on CentOS as well, so it's, I like YAM better. Uh, so after after you install it, uh, OC server is Open Connect server. After you install it, you need to create a server, a server certificate, and uh, a CA. This can be done automatically if you don't really want to to buy one. So this will generate uh, a certificate for the server, this command. And uh, all you need to do to, to set up uh, to set up the server is edit this file afterwards, after you install it. <coughs> uh, here we will set up a server with a password authentication. It will ask the users a password. And uh, we instruct to give to give them uh, these addresses from this network, just randomly selected by me. And uh, it will send the DNS server for the clients to be that one. It's a random IP. The server will not work in practice. I mean, you have to set up with real uh, LAN uh, information there. But this will be a test server. And you will need to specify the port that the server will use. Uh, because this is a SSL VPN server, typically the port, the default port is 443. <coughs> uh, I don't know how familiar you are with VPN. With VPN, you can either tell the client uh, to, to use uh, the VPN server you connect to for all the routes. So for default route, so everywhere the client visits, it will go through the server. Or you can just tell the client that uh, I serve this IP, this set of IP addresses, uh, this prefix. So if you specify this, 
you just tell uh, the client that, okay, I'm serving these addresses. And uh, don't try to connect for all internet connections to me. Okay, if you want to do the alternative, you do this. Uh, this option. <coughs> thing is that uh, why, why, uh, the reason why it doesn't work with the caching DNS, uh, the default setup, because you don't, uh, basically the network manager doesn't know how to, if I don't want to have DNS for everything to, to be forwarded to your server, then, then uh, it doesn't know how, which domains are, uh, which, which domains, uh, for which domains uh, it should restrict the uh, uh, so network manager does send this information. You mean to the caching server? It should have sent that uh, because the server sends all the information. Network manager supposed I don't, if, to specify. If you, if you specify just this information, there is no information which is the domain uh, for for the DNS. Ah uh, yes, yes. If you only specify this, but uh, inside the configuration, you can set which are your split DNS uh, domains. Your yeah, server. and did you? Specify it on your yes, on yes, and I don't know why it should be. Then, then it must be a bug in the bug in the bug in the bug. We have 15 minutes, and I'll take 10 minutes more. Okay, let's. Uh, Uh, who is in this part of the, the test? Just raise your hand. Okay, and uh, after you set up a configuration file and uh, with this information, you, you need to enable the ports in the firewall. In uh, typical Fedora, you just need to open the port for three port from firewall B if you use this port. I have the specified IP for network range. Mm -hmm. Showing that your network IP is not any good. Yes, you have find this option. Ah, you only put that information. Uh, you have to delete the original file and just. Uh,
Back in the orchestra configuration of this error because this is what is we're getting by default. And, uh, and this one is right about example code. So. Uh, so be, but you said it work with the client, with the command line client. Yeah, it, but it, because so, because it uh, it did not um, uh, it just replaced the uh, the whole server uh, whole server the result uh, the DNS server in result code. Okay, it could be because the configuration was changed to for the hundred, so I don't know if uh, there's something there. But uh, anyway, let's move to the server side, and uh, you can uh, you can start open connect server uh, using uh, system D. And uh, in a in a real world scenario, you would like to to set up your firewall in a way that communication between VPN users and your LAN uh, is allowed. Uh, this is an example using a servwall. Uh, I mean, you can use whatever firewall you you have. And uh, the interesting for me information is uh, after after you set set it up. There's some commands which allow you to see the status of the server and uh, how many users are connected and uh, how, how much they're downloading and everything. So the status, the status command shows you something like that. But uh, the server is online for so many hours. There is one client connected. How many IPs are in the ban list? The ban list is uh, the thing that uh, stopped you from connecting in the beginning. Uh, if there is a single IP connection all the time, mm -hmm. it blocks it. And that is the status uh, page. And uh, you can also get an overview of uh, the connected users. So with the OC CTL tool, you type show users in it and you see uh, the username, the group it belongs to, the IP he connected from, the IP he was given in the VPN, the device he is using, and, and cipher information. And you can even get uh, specific information for a user uh, which is more, more detailed, you can see which uh, client he connected with. This is the Open Connect uh, client, for example, it can be another client. Uh, how much he's downloading, the average bandwidth he's using. So I'm stuck on the authentication. Uh, oh, I don't see. Of the server or the client? Yeah, setting up the server. Uh -huh. I want to add a user to the OC serve, uh, a sweetie community. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the format? Or I can ah, uh, there is a tool OC passwd. That uh, you can use it to add users and uh, set their password. Oh, okay, thanks. I will write it in the other part. It's already 40 minutes, yeah. yeah. 
So let me check. You can use the other part the even up after the the talk. And another thing, you can disconnect the user. And there are some other examples for to set up the server with certificate authentication and. Uh, And stuff. An interesting setup is uh, you, if you use uh, Kerberos <coughs> in your line, uh, if you use IPA for example, uh, there is a recipe how to set up OCServe in a way to do sync sign on. So when you connect to the VPN, you are also connected to the LAN using Kerberos and you can see all the services uh, without a second authentication. So I give the floor to Paul who will tell you about uh, Libreswan and the IPsec. Four by three. <coughs> so I downloaded the four by three template, but it's quite different. Okay. So I'll give you a very, really quick primer on IPsec, um, then show you the configuration samples, and then we can just build tunnels to each other or to the same server that we've been using for the OpenConnect uh, tunnels. So the different part uh, with um, with an, with an IPsec tunnel is that there's two parts of it. One is the command channel that happens in userland. It's called Ike, the Internet Key <coughs> Exchange. And the actual crypto part of the packets is done by the kernel, not by the userland program. So that happens inside the kernel. So Ike is the command channel for setting up IPsec tunnels, and the IPsec tunnels actually do the encryption. Um, since Ike um, is going to negotiate like crypto material, um, it also <coughs> needs to be encrypted itself. It's a little confusing. So the Ike command channel is encrypted, but it's only used to set up the tunnels that provide encryption. Um, so for Linux, the way you, uh, you talk to the kernel IPsec subsystem is to use the Netlink uh, interface with the XFRM sub, uh, subset. Um, the, the standard way on most other OSs is the PFK interface, but uh, it's no longer maintained in the kernel, so whatever is left there is sort of a half implementation. Um, it's also known to lie about what the kernel supports, so if you, for instance, have certain crypto algorithms, the kernel will always say that they don't exist, or will always say that they do exist, so um, they cannot really use them. Um, use the IPXFM state and IPXFM poll commands to uh, get the raw kernel information um, about IPsec. And if you want to do any IP table rules, you can, you can specifically match packets that, that came in encrypted but have since been decrypted by the kernel by using the dash m policy and the dash dash poll IPsec. So you can, for instance, say, I only want uh, port 25 traffic that has come in over IPsec. So then uh, you can block for 25 for the plain text, but um, but it's a it's a it's a way of matching the IPsec packets after decryption. So it's sort of it's it's a taint that that keeps with the packet. So you know which packets were encrypted before. Um, there's two versions of Ike: Ike v1, and Ike v2. Um, as you can see, they're both really old. Um, so obviously, most people still use Ike v1 because it was it was working well enough. Um, only in the last two years have we seen an, uh, an, a dramatic increase in IPv2, mostly because of iPhone and Android. Um, the IPv runs over UDP port 500, um, and to uh, work around some helpful devices that vendors created at some point um, that messed with that port, we also moved it to 4500 for net traversal techniques. Um, 
Two more terms you'll hear regularly is um, security associations. That's what they basically mean when, when the two peers have come to some kind of agreement and they have an open command channel to each other. It's called an apparent SA or an I security uh, association. Um, in really old terms, it's also called a phase one. Um, and that's the part where authentication um, happens in different ways. I appreciate TRSA, X509, GSS API. Um, there's also AAP plugins and other, other things. The IPsec SA is the security association that the, both systems have about the IPsec encryption itself. Um, so there's, they, they keep a copy in user land just to know what's in the kernel. Um, if you look at on the wire, uh, the IPsec protocol uh, uses protocol 50 called ESP. Um, so a lot of admins make the mistake of like not understanding that it's not port 50 because they're used to dealing with TCP and UDP that has ports. Um, e ESP does not have any ports. Um, it is so it's protocol number 50. Um, all the other things I guess you can mostly forget. Um, there's two modes: tunnel mode and transport mode. A tunnel mode is a full entire packet inside another packet, where transport mode is just the the packet itself being as much encrypted as you can. But of course, you cannot then encrypt everything because then you cannot know where the packet is going to. So it leaks like source assassination, obviously, uh, and some other header information. Um, transport mode is mostly used because it saves a few bytes because you're not adding an entire packet inside a packet. Um, but usually it's not really needed. Um, if, you're at the, if you're at the end point of an IPsec tunnel, usually people lower the MTU to like 1200 or something just to avoid the 10 layer of encapsulations that happen on the way you know, between your ISP and the world. Um, so usually it's, uh, you use tunnel mode. Um, authenticated header was also a way of doing um, uh, authenticated packets but not encrypted packets um, and nobody should use it anymore but again whenever the IETF tries to remove it there's a few people that stand up and say no we use this you cannot remove it so it will never go away but it's not really used by anyone um, so all of this luckily you don't really need to know because all the defaults on Librespawn are set in such a way that they use the right things um, so installing Librespawn is pretty simple um, just install Librespawn package um, the one maybe confusing things is that the service is not called Librespawn but IPsec, um, which turned out to be a good thing because originally this software was called FreeSwan and then it was called OpenSwan and now it's called Librespawn. Uh, <laughs> luckily, the service name has never changed. Um, also, since um, uh, FreeSwan actually started in the mid 90s, um, there were no advanced init systems, so everybody had to type etc init.d, rc3.d, uh, ipsec start. So we already built our own wrappers around this, so we can just do ipsec start, ipsec stop, ipsec restart. Um, and of course now it will look at what init system is running, and if it's system it will call system ctl, if it's running upstart it will do the upstart thing. Um, the other, uh, so if you want to do the network manager GUI site for the client, you install network manager Libuson GNOME, or depending on if you're on an older Fedora, you still have to use network manager OpenSwan GNOME. Um, we made sure that both packages um, support OpenSwan and Libuson. Uh, OpenSwan has been obsoleted by Libuson, so um, depending on which of the ones available on your system, uh, depends on your Fedora version. So let's get to the um, configuration. This is the full configuration needed for a simple tunnel from one IP to another IP. So um, one thing that might also get some little used to is that we're using the terms left and right because IPsec is a peer-to-peer -peer system. So there is no source destination or there is no server client. So um, when they designed the software, they decided to call it left and right, where left means the, the server that's on the left side of your diagram. And of course, if you turn over the diagram, it's the other way around, it's the right side. And so it's arbitrary. You can decide whether you call it left or right. Um, once the daemon starts, it will look at all the IP addresses it has configured, and it will figure out whether it is left or whether it is right. So this also means that you can take this configuration to the other machine without changing it and use it there too. Mm -hmm. 
We thought it was really clever, um, but it's caused a lot of grief because people just don't find it intuitive to use left and right. Um, auth by secret means like a pre-shared key, and you can drop in a secret file in the IPsec D directory where you can get a new address in and you say PSK for pre-shared key and then the secret. And once you do this, uh, the only thing you need to do is uh, restart the service and your tunnel should be up. So if people want to try it, then um, we can try with the neighbor or I can talk a bit more about more configurations first. Any preference? How do you specify multiple servers in the core? Like, you okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go through more configurations and these, okay. then this will come up. So if you want to add uh, a network to a, a subnet to a subnet, then the only thing you need to add is left subnet is a right subnet is. And if you want multiple subnets, it's actually write subnets with an S and then a comma separate list of multiple sitters. And then you can explode them as, as much as you want. Uh, what we call subnet extrusion is actually um, what I use myself as well at home, is um, where you call one side the subnet 0 slash 0 and the other is your subnet. So what you're basically doing is you're moving a subnet to your other location. So for instance, um, this range, uh, 192, uh, 192, 1, 0 slash 24, is a range I own in Amsterdam. And so on the Amsterdam server, there is uh, this configuration. And this is my DSL IP address at home. And so it says, I actually have this subnet. And so, and so, uh, and, and every, Every destination from this packet to anywhere in the world has to go through the tunnel. So basically, these 16 IP addresses live now in my space in Toronto. Uh, and if you do a trace route to it, you'll see a trace route happening to Amsterdam and then a really slow hop, the last hop, which looks like a single hop because of the IPsec tunnel. And it actually goes all the way to Canada. So this is how you move a subnet around, which is a really useful feature. Especially if you want IPs in your home and your ISP only gives you one. Um, so, configuration so far, we've used that pre shared key. So, this is one where we're using RSA. So, you run IPsec new host key that just generates a new RSA key uh, for use with IPsec. Um, you can display by using IPsec show host key and then you can type uh, dash dash left or dash dash right and it will just show you the line that you have to put in the file that specifies the key. Um, so the output of IPsec share host key, you can send over email, it's just a public key. Uh, so you can exchange it. You can um, come up with a random ID, it's not really used, it's only used for matching, so it doesn't matter. So for instance, uh, Paul and Nikos. And then, now the configuration is slightly changed. Left ID is specified and right ID is specified. Um, and then left RSA is a key, and then this is shortened. It's a really long block of a, of a key. <coughs> and write the uh, RSA key. And off by is RSA set of uh, secret key. So now you're using RSA, which is much more secure than using pre shared key. And so there's no entry needed in the secret. So you don't need the secrets file because once it generated that RSA key, it stored the private parts of the key in the in a specific NSS uh, database that's stored in the uh, etc ipsec.d, which can be protected by FIPS passwords and other things. But is it on both? How it gets on both sides? Sorry. How it gets on both sides? So you um, you exchange with the other end the public key, which you. Um, when you do IPsec show host key. Ah, okay. Where are you? So you create, do you need to create that on both sides? A new host? Yeah, the new, yeah, yeah, new, yeah, yeah, new yeah so new host, and, yeah, both, both parties generate an RSA key with new host key, then they run 
show host key to just get the public key and you exchange them. Oh, yeah. And then how you apply them? Like, is there a command like apply or use this key or you just put it into the configuration? You put it into the, um, into the configuration. Okay. Like, you, you, okay. Um, I'll, I'll go out of full screen mode on the presentation and with a terminal and I can, I can show some more things. Um, um, so another feature on demand tunnels. So if you do a subnet to subnet uh, connection, um, you might not want to have it up all the time. So if you want to bring it up only when there's packets there, you can just change to say auto is on demand. Basically instructs the kernel and says these packets may not leak out. If you get a packet for this, Go talk to the Ike daemon and give us a notification and we'll set up the tunnel. Um, the one problem with this is that the first packet that actually triggers that kernel message is eaten by the kernel and dies. So if you're doing something like a TCP or if you're doing a ping, you're missing it one ping packet. If you're doing a TCP connect, you're missing that first TCP connect. Um, I have been trying to tell the people that they should really implement a packet caching for this so that they cache you know, uh, at least one or two packets uh, so that once the tunnel is up they can release the packets. But um, Herbert Sue has not been convinced yet that uh, he should write the code. Um, dynamic IP. Um, so for one, if you are on a dynamic IP, you can do left equals uh, uh, percent its default route. It will just pick up the IP you have and use that to go out. Um, if you want the other side to be random when they connect to you, you can use write as percentage any. Of course, this you can't really use in real life because if, if both ends don't know where to find each other, then it stops, right? Um, so normally in, this, in these cases where you're both on dynamic IP, you make sure you have a DNS host name that gets updated. And if you use a host name for these, um, then they will also uh, properly just work. And it, it will do, whenever it tries to bring up the tunnel again or re keys, it will re look up the, uh, the DNS. So if it's changed in the, in the meanwhile, it will find the new IP address. Um, you also use usually uh, auto equals add instead of start or on demand because uh, if the partner you're trying to talk to, the remote partner, is, is any, you don't know where they are. So you cannot initiate to them. You have to wait for them to initiate to you. So, so this is not a, a configuration that would be identical on both sides of the... Um, this is a typical uh, Cisco IPsec uh, connection. So this is where we're basically emulating a Cisco server. Um, which, uh, if you look on the Android, on the, so on iPhone it's called Cisco IPsec, on Android it's called RSA XAuth, it's basically the same thing. It's using IPv1 uh, with some extensions called XAuth. Um, so you'll see some new things. Um, so this one is with certificates. So, um, so I didn't put the clients in there yet. No. Um, so, okay, so you import the certificates, which I'll show later. And you specify left cert, uh, you specify by the export name that was chosen for the PKSS12 certificate. Um, you say left XL server, left uh, mode config server, yes. And on the right side, you say uh, client, yes. You can assign uh, an address pool. You pick a bunch of addresses. Uh, <coughs> you say write subnet is 0000, zero, zero, zero to get all traffic. And these are just some specific, you can give a DNS server, you can give it uh, a DNS name for what domain you want to get DNS queries for. <coughs> and you basically, yes, uh, uh, so this is what I use to connect my iPhone to my home network. And this is the same with pre-shared key. Um, the difference is um, usually you say remote peer type is Cisco to, to enable some Cisco tweaks. Um, usually those setups also use aggressive mode and they're very specific. Cisco is very specific about the crypto parameters. The whole point of Ike was that you can send a whole bunch of proposals and then you know the two peers will negotiate the one that they both like. 
that Cisco is more secure, so as soon as they see something that they don't like, they just stop talking to you, not to reveal any information, um, which is not what the protocol is about. Um, so you used to have to specify it specifically. So this is one way of specifying two proposals. One is for AS256 with SHA-1, with a different element size of 1024, and the other one is AS256 SHA-1 with uh, the same group. Yeah, the same. One should be 128. This one should be 128. So, error on the side. Um, the ESP, so Ike is the encryption algorithms for the Ike connection. The ESP is the encryption done by the kernel for the, for the actual packet encryption. Um, the, I, the, the group name is specified as the ID. So what Cisco calls group name is what, what in Ike terms is really the, the ID of the client. So this um, basically, this is this almost comes straight from my configuration to connect to the Red Hat VPN. So the network manager plugin, if you want to test it against the DEF CON server, um, you can just go to add VPN plugin, uh, then go to the identity tab, and you basically fill in the gateway, you leave the group name out, um, and then user uh, group password, is the, the, the group password is the pre-shared key, um, and then username and password is the same. You can test one, two, uh, two, eight. Um, <clears throat> so once, uh, when I was making these slides last week, I actually had to talk to some of the network manager people because they expect to um, deal with routing. So whenever we added a route, they were sort of deleting them from us. So uh, one side effect is that in the latest package that's in Fedora right now, when you disconnect your VPN, you'll actually lose your default route. But there will be a fix for that soon once they uh, roll a new version of the package. <coughs> Some quick minds to um, add your connection, delete, um, bring it up, bring it down. Starts our reset. Um, IPsec wag dash dash listen is used whenever you gain a new interface or lose an interface and things change and Pluto, the, the IDM has to reorient itself to figure out uh, who it is. <coughs> so that should usually not be needed by the end user themselves. Um, some other useful check. IPsec Verify will do a quick check on your system to see if the settings are right. There are some, um, some um, uh, sysctl settings that could be weird. Uh, forwarding might be disabled. Uh, might, things might be uh, RP filter. Um, people know RP filter? It's a, it's a proc setting you can enable which uh, very smartly um, automatically bl uh, drops packets that come from a destination it couldn't have possibly arrived on. So if you have like ETH0 with a 10 slash 8 address and, and, uh, and suddenly a packet for, for 10 has originated on ETH1, then it will be smart and say, well, that could never happen. That should, the routing tells me it should have come from ETH0, it can never come from ETH1. And so it will drop the packet. Unfortunately, the code is not smart enough to realize that a packet could have come in encrypted, got decrypted to another IP address, and then got onto the machine. So uh, RP filter, you always have to disable on an IPsec uh, machine. <coughs> um, IPsec WAC um, status, traffic status shows you similar as uh, OpenConnect, how much traffic the uh, user have been, <coughs> the users have been doing. <clears throat> the IPsec status command is um, what was never meant for humans, only for developers, but since we took up the easy name, everybody uses it. It gives you like basically a dump of the entire ID means uh, internal. Uh, and IPsec barf is what we sometimes ask people to give us if they have a lot of problems and we want to understand their system. It actually makes a sort of snapshot of their entire system uh, related to IPsec.
And the last two commands are for importing certificates. So if you want to do anything with certificates, you get a PKCS12 file and you just do IPsec import and it will call the, the proper cert utils or PK11 util uh, for you. And if you want to see what's in the NSS database, you can also use this cert util command. <coughs> But our real true goal is to encrypt the entire internet with IPsec. Nobody should be sending packets without encrypting them. So, um, so the LibSound project, and this, this is what actually started the FreeSound project in the mid-90s, uh, mid was everything should be encrypted. Um, so we call that opportunistic encryption. Uh, the term is a little bit uh, vague now because people associated different things to it. Uh, but basically the idea is whenever you are going to send out a plain text packet, why don't you look and see if you can somehow build up an authenticated connection with it, uh, an I connection, and then start an IPsec tunnel with it. Um, and um, as of last year, there's now even a possibility to do an unauthenticated IPsec tunnel. So you just say, I don't know who you are, but let's talk IPsec, because hey, the NSA is monitoring us, and let's just try and, and encrypt it. Um, so we have the unauthenticated one working. Uh, the old DNS one is um, not working, but we're replacing it with a DNSSEC one. And we're also working on the GSS API one and Kerberos one. So that basically allows you to encrypt your entire LAN as a mesh. So whenever one machine in your LAN sends a packet to another machine in your LAN, the kernel will catch the packet, tell the Ike daemon, hey, you should set up an IPsec tunnel in there. We set up the tunnel everything gets encrypted automatically. So you don't have to specify one configuration for each host in your network. <coughs> now that I can, uh, I can see if I can demo that. Um, although it doesn't really work here on, on the Wi-Fi, so I'll just log into uh, another system. Um, so this is actually the, the, the demo server that we've been using. Uh, so I sneakily already enabled... Uh, why is it so slow? <laughs> okay. Wow, it's like being on a modem. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So you can see that's already, uh, so, oh. <coughs> okay, so one user connected with the, uh, with the, the configuration. Uh, and the, the, the three before, the clear or private, you can see there, those are three other machines that um, have an unauthenticated IPsec, so they're anonymous. So they just happen to send packets, and those are um, oelibuswan.org. No, we one.libreswan.org. There's a few of those. O OE up to, I think, OE4 we have now. So those machines um, sort of continuously ping each other uh, via cron to set up, bring up the tunnels. It's our little testing system for this. Um, but they also do this to the entire world. <coughs> now, of course, you have to remember if the other end didn't actually uh, support IPsec. You don't want to hammer them every time to see if they can IPsec. So, we do remember that for a while, so I'll see. So we call those uh, things a shunt. So we place a sh we place a shunt in the door to say, like, okay, we don't do. Um, okay, so that's not a good example. Okay, let's, uh, let's actually pick the...
Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Sorry, let me just find another machine. I think someone might have, another developer might have reconfigured these machines for another test. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what is better to use to manage the IPsec now? So, IPsec outro and some attributes or IPsec what? No, so if you want to just monitor the tunnels, the IPsec WAC dash dash traffic status is the one to use because that gives you one line per tunnel in the output. Like the um, the IPsec status one gives you a lot of details, but it's really hard to parse. You don't really want to parse it automatically. Still some broken version in there. Okay, I'll try the last one. Um, I run an open DNS resolver, uh, which um, gets a lot of traffic, and so we use that for some stress testing. Um, So then it's guaranteed to have the right <coughs> installed. <coughs> so Vince, we found that um, you have to be really careful about logging. If you, you can't really even log like, oh, opportunistic tunnel didn't work in one line. Like on a DNS server, your, your disk is filled within four hours. Anyone else have any questions on IPsec? Oh, here we go. So here, here you see a list of uh, shunts. So it has tried to do opportunistic IPsec to all of those machines, and it uh, it has remembered this for and remembered this for about an hour or so that it didn't work. Now this, so this list probably has like 64,000 entries or so because it's my DNS server. So with the Wi-Fi here, my shell is now lost, I think. So anyway, so, so the goal is to have like a full mesh encryption both in the enterprise and if possible, like internet wide. Uh, so that's what we're currently working on as, uh, as stream. So, uh, <clears throat> so if we do the, so, so we can do the um, opportunistic with XOP and certificates with Let's Encrypt. Uh, 
Um, and then so we say, okay, we trust the, the Let's Encrypt CA. Um, yeah, but so they only sign uh, host names, not IP addresses. Yeah, but we just use their um, their certificate. So we once we connect to a server, to uh, an IP address with a packet, that server will then, when we try to do IKE, will give us their certificate. And then in that certificate will be their name, which is not their IP address, but we don't care. Now what we can do, what I've been thinking of, maybe we should do an extra check where we look up in the, in the DNS to see if that was actually their name or not. So that there's a little extra check that there's no man in the middle. But, because of course anybody can answer, anyone can steal the routing and, and take over an IP address and, and get a Let's Encrypt uh, valid certificate. Um, but remember, the, the, the goal of opportunistic encryption is to encrypt when you would otherwise have sent it out plain text. It is never a replacement for like a hard enterprise encryption or like, a, like, like that you want to do properly. So like the, the Kerberos GSS API, you know, has to be done properly. So there's no man in the middle possible. There's no token shuffling or other things happening. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. If you connect it once, can you be sure that you're connecting to them the same thing another time? So if you... You mean, do you, do you want to do the SSH thing of the known hosts file? Yeah, is there some way to, to, to be sure it's the same one you connect to? It is, you say there's no authentication, but can you at least be sure it's the same one? Or would you have to exchange some... Token? You could, but, how, but, but what do you do when it's not? Because like everybody on dynamic IP addresses, you will talk to different people with different uh, sessions. So you can't really tell that they're somebody. Um, also, the um, one of the modes we want to do is where only one side is anonymous and the other side is not. So traditionally, IPsec, both peers authenticate each other. And uh, with the uh, with the non-authentication, it's now possible to, to be unauthenticated. Um, and that's something that actually TLS had as an advantage. The reason so much HTTPS encryption happened in the last 10 years is because people didn't have to configure their own identity on their machine. They could just connect to the server and it was their job to authenticate the server and the server didn't really care. It would talk plain text or encrypted to anyone who talks to, who's going to talk to it. And so IPsec was missing that mode. So by finally having this, uh, this RFC out, we can now do the same in, in IPsec. So where a client can connect and go say, okay, I'm just gonna verify that that server is really that server, that IPsec server, but I'm not gonna even tell them who I am because they don't need to know. Okay, um, I think we're pretty much out of time. What is the, uh, 10 minutes? 10, 10 minutes? Okay. 10 minutes. <coughs> So if people want to set up some IPsec tunnels, go for it. Um, or some more questions, or some more questions for Nikos. Yeah. Uh, one question. Um, opportunistic encryption, uh, does it use transfer mode? No. Do you use tunnel mode? Yes. Because, okay. because transport mode is evil and should die. Because with the presence of NAT, it's terrible. Because with transport mode, you're basically encrypting on the, the, the packet itself, right? So you're not encapsulating another packet inside. But then when you go through a NAT, these IP addresses get replaced for other IP addresses. So then you break the encryption. So the, the, um, the only case where transport mode really still is used is the, <coughs> is the L2P IPsec with Windows 95. Um, and that's sort of a weird transport mode because it sort of also does tunnel mode. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. Whenever you say transport mode, I, I have to. Sorry. Even for IPv6. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter what it's I, I, before IPv6. So I mean, and really, the only thing you gain is a few bytes. Like it's not like transport mode gets you a few bytes, and then. 
So if you so if you want if you want to do it so the the way the the way the um, the configuration of the opportunistic works yeah, let me just bring up a new shell that's local. So we define, uh, first of all, we have a group called clear, which um, is the group that we never want to talk IPsec to. So this is where you can put your whitelist in, like, you know, never, never do IPsec there. Um, then we have clear or private, which means um, don't initiate IPsec to them, but if they do IPsec to us, we'll do IPsec with them. Then it's private or clear, which means we'll try to do IPsec, and if that fails, we'll do clear. And it's private, where we go like, okay, we'll initiate IPsec and we expect them to have IPsec. And then there's block and never talk to them. So you can see here, these are just regular IPsec configurations. So if you, want, if you want to go like, well, I really want to use transport mode, then you can just say try this transport. And then you have transport mode. If you really want to, you can, you can do it like that. Well, I, I forgot that. Um, yeah, and then... Right, and then, um, sorry, the, um, and, then, and then so in the, uh, there's a directory, etc, epsec will be policies, and it actually contains the sitter addresses of what you want to do. So if I look at private or clear here, in this case, we only put zero slash zero in. And here, so, so in these files, you can basically say, okay, this range goes into clear, this range goes into clear private, or this range goes into private or clear. Uh, so you can sort of uh, determine with whom you want to do opportunistic encryption. This, So I guess I'm supposed to throw these to anyone who asks questions. <laughs> I think maybe they just had too many of them. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, for other, other program too. So you can get a gift up to free. <laughs> Um, so we actually just redid that upstream um, where it will actually give you now in the in the regular log so without having to add any Pluto debug logs it will tell you to peer send these proposals and I have this proposal and therefore we didn't match yeah, it will be in the next version. Next version will be in. It's already in the. If you if you pull the Git version uh, from GitHub, it's already in. Yeah, we we actually had to completely rewrite the proposal code. Um, it was it was badly done. So for instance, um, it checked every element with every element, and like um, it turned out, uh, Strong Swan sent a massive amount of, uh, of options. Like it's like many ciphers, many algorithms. So, um, so we spent. If you enable debugging, we'd spend so much time in the debug just writing all these proposals out that it was too slow. It timed out. So we, so we read it. So we read it the entire proposal code. So now we're really fast. But and as a result of that, we can also just simply now print the line. So, so I can now check if, you have, if I have problem with the other side. And yes. I can say, this, and I can yes, and you yes, and you no longer have to enable debugging. So the um, it will already be in the no debug log. Yeah.
Slides, you don't put this on the right. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that all comes from free sound. So that all comes from all those terminology comes from free sound. There's a strong yeah, yeah, sound also for free sound. Right? What, what is the difference? Uh, are they still maintained? Strong sound. Strong sound is maintained. Yeah. I asked a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Deaf con person, but but I will um, only put them on the demo. Do you to talk about or not? No, Okay. After tomorrow noon. No, no, I mean today. Today? Yes, I'm meeting at five so is that my meeting for one hour? Wow. So I'll do it now. So I guess I'll do this and I'll do it. Where are you? Probably somewhere. Where is the meeting? I don't know why. That's a part of it. I don't know if you have a wrapper. Yes, so... So I don't know if you have a wrapper. I don't know if you have a wrapper. I don't know if you have a wrapper. On this side. On this side. On this side. On this side. Okay. 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 I will try to find you there. Yeah, because we don't have to set up. Gets changed into... Convert into a giant racket. Yes, this is for this. And then, yeah. yeah. uh, yes. what do you do? Don't you change the status of the piece of panels? Yeah, yeah. Because the project plan is from the start of the So the traffic status will show you. Yeah. So if you do traffic status, it was like, okay, that discussion, that brutal discussion that went on, puts it on the different way, I guess. Yes, yes. And the. But I was not aware. Yes, I was not aware. And then you also see how much, so when it was added and how much traffic it was. So three of your tunnels didn't have any traffic. The guys who were pushing tiny little things. These are out. Otherwise, it wouldn't be very hard to So if I want to check some grades, some graphs, some graphs, Check the state of this tunnels, and I guess I can grab this. this yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.